Uh, my name's Deborah Faleda, and I see some familiar faces because this is my home church when I'm not traveling. Uh, my husband and my four children, we attend here. We usually go to the 11 o'clock service, and you might see one or the other of us these days roaming the halls with our one and a half year old who's still not ready to go to nursery. Um, but that's, that's us, and I'm a licensed professional counselor, I'm an author, and the main focus of my ministry when I speak and I travel and I teach is to remind people that healthy people make healthy relationships. And if we want healthy relationships, we've gotta start with what's going on in here first. So everything I do from writing books to podcasts to sharing messages is rooted in that theme. So today I'm gonna to start the service in typical counselor form by asking you a few reflective questions, okay? Someone at the end of se uh, first service said to me, you've gotta tell these people that they're basically getting a free half hour of therapy. <laughs> so take notes. I'm not gonna bill you at the end of this. But the first question I wanna ask you is this. What fills you up? Take a minute to think about the answer to that. What fills you up? What energizes you? What gives you life and keeps you going? You might not know right away. Maybe some of you aren't really sure. You haven't thought about that. My next question to you is this. How full do you feel right now? Right now, in this moment, even consider the past month, maybe the past three months, and really tune into that. How full do you feel? And give yourself a number from one being, I'm feeling empty, to 10 being, I'm feeling full, I'm overflowing with fullness. Because the answer to that question is really going to inform us today and point us in the direction of caring for yourself. I'm calling today's message, Soul Care, living full to fully live. And here's why this matters. Because emptiness impacts everything. Empty people cannot fill up others, but full people can. My dad used to tell me growing up that human beings are like a well. We're made to pour out what God has given us. We're made to pour out and give water and help people who are thirsty. But what happens when you pour out and pour out some more and pour out a little bit more, but you're never refilling? You're never getting filled. Eventually, that well will get to the bottom. And what's at the bottom of a well? Mud, dirt, and my professional word is gunk. All the gunk at the bottom, we bring it all up and that's what we're giving people because we're no longer feeling full. And when we are empty, we're no longer able to pour out to our marriages, our ministries, our careers, our families. It all begins to suffer when we are feeling empty. Not only that, but I truly believe that it's God's will for us to be filled. Ephesians 3.17 says this, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. You've heard of that verse before, haven't you? How wide and deep and high God's love is. But you probably haven't tuned in to the latter part of that verse that says, I want you to know this, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Do you remember that part? It's not just to know it. It's to know it so that you may be filled. God longs for you to live full. When the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, Scripture says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. If you've grown up in church long enough, especially in charismatic circles, 
You've probably heard the term full, fill, filled with the Spirit, filled. We use it all the time. We talk about being full in the church a whole lot. But unfortunately, too many people in the church are actually living empty lives. Over the past few years especially, I've met a lot of empty people. In my work as a counselor, just having the opportunity to work with people day in and day out, I've met a lot of empty people. And I can guarantee with the size of this room that there are people in here today that are feeling empty. Maybe you just don't know it. Maybe you haven't acknowledged it. Maybe you're not ready to admit it. You're just pushing through. Here are some signs that you might be empty and you don't know it. Maybe you're feeling overwhelmed lately. And when I say overwhelmed, I mean there's seasons when life brings overwhelming circumstances. But there's also times when we feel overwhelmed at things that logically we know shouldn't be overwhelming. That maybe in a different season this wouldn't overwhelm me. I remember being in an empty season with little children and thinking that unloading the dishwasher seemed overwhelming. It's just a task that normally would just be a task, but you know you're feeling empty when normal everyday tasks just begin to feel so overwhelming. Maybe you're experiencing a loss of motivation or energy. You know, you just can't get done the things that you wanna do. You just don't have the energy for it. Maybe you're feeling more tired and fatigued than usual. You get out of bed and you're still exhausted. You're just not feeling energy. Maybe you're finding an increase in depression or anxiety. Maybe you're feeling alone even while you're surrounded by people. You're just not connecting with the people around you. Maybe you find that your thoughts are becoming more and more negative and cynical and jaded and you just feel like your mind is consumed with worry and negativity. You might be feeling empty. Or maybe you have a lack of feelings altogether. You just don't care. You're feeling apathetic towards life or irritable towards the people around you. Tension, conflict more than usual, or anger. I think in general, most people who are feeling empty would say a general lack of enjoyment and excitement in life is kind of the norm. And if that's you today, I want to ask you this. Why do you think so many of us get to that point of feeling empty? I mean, shouldn't we know how to fill up? Shouldn't we know how to take care of ourselves? I think the answer to that question, we're empty because most of us have never really learned to care for ourselves. Think about it. Did anyone ever really teach you to care for yourself? That almost seems contradictory to church, doesn't it? In fact, we almost hear the opposite message in church. Care for everybody else. Do ministry, pour out, keep going, push through. Don't think about yourself. But that's not the message of the gospel. And I'm gonna prove it to you a little bit later today. You know, when we look at scripture, Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That word as is a really important balancing beam. Because Jesus could have said, love your neighbor and don't love anybody else. He could have said, love your neighbor, don't love yourself. But he didn't. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. If you think of it like a balancing beam, the as gives us that balance. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And we're not loving ourself for the sake of self. We're loving ourselves so that we can pour out. We're caring for ourselves so that we can do what God has called us to do. It's the opposite of selfishness because when we fill up, we're filling up for a purpose and that purpose is to fulfill God's calling in our life. Empty people can't do that. I met 
a woman named Madeline a little while ago in counseling. Madeline is a woman in her 30s, and she came into counseling feeling burnt out, empty, discontent. But the thing about Madeline is that her life wasn't too bad. She had a pretty good life. She was a single woman, accomplishing things, had a great career, successful, financially independent. But as we dug deeper into her story, it became clear that most of her life, Madeline had been caring for others. Her life revolved around the needs of others. She was the oldest of four siblings. You know us first children, right? We've got our own set of issues. We take responsibility for everything, don't we? And her parents got a divorce at a young age. So now they're in conflict, you know? And she's kind of the middle person. She's the oldest, she's helping them. And then her father gets ill, so she's taking care of him. And then her mother needs help with her business, so she's helping her mom. And then her brother starts struggling with substance abuse, alcoholism, drugs, DUIs, and he needs help, so he goes to her for help. And then, of course, her job is demanding. And then ministry knocks on her door. Her church is like, hey, Madeline, you're single, right? You have tons of free time. Why don't you come and help? We need, we need people. We need volunteers. Come serve. So she starts serving in children's ministry. And then the women's ministry is like, Madeline, we could really use a small group leader. So she jumps in and does that. She's got a really full life. A lot of good things. But Madeline is giving and giving and giving and giving. And now she's sitting in my office in tears feeling like she has nothing left to give. She is empty. So I asked Madeline, we ask a lot of questions in counseling, did you get that vibe yet? I asked Madeline to help me get to the roots of why she's functioning the way she is. Why are you in the role that you're in? Why are you doing what you're doing? What patterns and cycles have led to where you are today? Madeline thought through this and was able to identify some of the patterns that started way back in childhood, raised in a dysfunctional and chaotic home where she constantly felt like she had to fill in the gaps for her parents. She constantly felt like she had to be the one to help everybody get along. If I don't do it, no one else will, she said. If I don't fix it, no one else will and something bad will happen. She started getting to the roots of some of the things that led to the patterns in her life today. And that's where healing begins. When we can look back and start to heal from some of those wounds and lies and toxic cycles that we maybe used to survive back then, but now they're destroying us today. She had to get to the root of her why and start unpacking what was going on inside so that she could learn to care for herself. I guess I'm still trying to fix everything for everyone to this day, she said. Even after giving my life to Jesus, I've continued to believe that somehow I am responsible for everyone else. I fear that if I don't fix it, things will fall apart and in the end I'll be alone. But ironically, I'm feeling very alone right now she said. This right here, my friends, is where true healing and change happens because it's not just about what we do. It's about why we do it. If you really want to change, you have to begin with the why. And this isn't just a female problem. I don't want you gentlemen to tune out because, you know, sometimes we think of women as the ones that give and serve and pour into the kids and the family. That is not the norm any longer, is it? And not only that, but so many of you men are pouring out in your own ways, and you're empty. Paul was a man I met in his 50s who came in for counseling, a thriving senior pastor of a church. His ministry was booming, but he was not thriving. 
He was struggling. He was feeling empty. And he didn't even know if he could continue to do what God had called him to do. He was done. And as we dug into Paul's story, it turns out that Paul comes from a family with a really abusive stepdad. He bullied him severely. And it was my way or the highway for Paul. And when you grow up in that kind of chaotic environment, what do you learn to do about your own needs? You learn to stuff them. Because you don't wanna rock the boat. You don't wanna cause conflict. There's no room in this family for my needs because everybody's crazy, everybody's got stuff going on. I don't wanna get injured or abused. So I'm just gonna keep quiet. I'm gonna make myself small and be as quiet as possible. And if I have a need, mm -mm, I'm just gonna stuff it away because it's not safe here to express my needs. And that's how you learn to survive. The problem is you never learn to understand your needs, to express your needs, to even allow yourself to have needs. And so Paul had been stuffing and stuffing and stuffing. And even after he came to Jesus, he was still stuffing and he had never really learned to care for himself. Paul and Madeline have completely different stories, totally different backgrounds, but they both ended up at the same place. They just had a different why. They had a different reason that they were there, but they were both empty. All these underlying beliefs that they had been carrying had led them to an unhealthy place. Maybe you, like Madeline, believe that if you don't do it, no one else will. Jesus says, I will fight for you. You need only to be still. Exodus 14, 14. Or maybe like Paul, you've learned to put your needs on the back burner and ignore them so as not to cause a fight. But Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus wants you to share your needs with him. Maybe you actually believe it's selfish to care for yourself. I've heard that from a lot of people in this area. You know, I don't often call out people specifically, but some of these Mennonite Amish roots really have a hard time caring for yourself. And sometimes we have to battle some of those lies that it's wrong. Whatever it is, We've got to get to the root of our why. Why do I struggle so much with this? Why am I living empty? I wanna ask you this. What false beliefs or hurts or lies might be leading you to living an empty life? Because if you don't get to the bottom of your why, nothing that we're about to share is gonna matter. I could have easily told Paul and Madeline, you know what, you need to say no to, more, to ministry. You need to limit your time at work. You need to say no to your family, set more boundaries. But if they don't get to the root of the why, after a little while, they're gonna go right back into their cycle. Because it's not about what you do, it's about why you're doing it. Empty people can't fill others up. Now that we're getting to the root of our why, let's turn our attention to what to do about it. Once you've figured out your why, you got to the bottom of it, you're working to heal from that and learning the importance of caring for yourself. What do you do to care for yourself? How do you fill up? Let me start by telling you some of the things that you do that don't actually work, okay? Let me call some of you out. The first thing you do is you run to the fridge for calories that you don't need. Usually around 10 p.m., the munchies kick in, you've had a long day, you should reward yourself. You go to the pantry, grab a bag of chips, popcorn, grab a tub of ice cream, and you know it's not good for you, you know it's not healthy, but you're feeling empty. You know, you gotta fill up before tomorrow. Maybe you pick up the Target shopping app. There's a lot of great deals on that Circle app, isn't there, ladies? And you go online and you're looking at things you need to buy that's gonna help you feel better with money that's not actually in your budget. Maybe you're binge watching Netflix shows. 
until 3 a.m. when you know you should be getting rest and sleep. Maybe you're scrolling through your phones endlessly instead of being present with the people around you, trying to fill up. Maybe it's watching random YouTube videos and you're like, how did I even get on this one? You know, how many kitten videos are there on the internet, people? (laughs) And you're just going through all these videos one at a time, one at a time, wasting your time, not actually getting filled. Maybe you're running to unhealthy things like toxic relationships or sexual sin and struggle. Pornography, drugs, alcohol, gambling. What are you using to try and fill up? Here's the thing about it. These things never work. In fact, they perpetuate the cycle of emptiness because empty things can't fill up empty people. Only Jesus can. And Jesus just modeled to us so well the importance of filling up in healthy ways and caring for yourself. He was fully God, but also fully man. He knew the limitations of the human body. And he practiced caring for himself in five ways. We're going to talk about those five things today. And I want you to really hone in on this because we're learning from the life of Jesus. This isn't some psychology, psychobabble, This is God's truth. And sure, psychology talks this stuff, believes it, walks it, lives it, because all truth is God's truth. So let's dig into God's word and see how Jesus cared for himself. Number one, nourish. Jesus took the time to eat and drink. I think we take this one for granted, but our bodies were made to be fueled in order to function at their best and fueled with healthy foods. I'm not talking about that tub of Breyer's ice cream, right? Healthy foods and nutritious foods. The, there's so many passages in scripture about Jesus taking the time to eat, sitting around the table, having a meal with friends, having food prepared for him. Luke 7:34 even says that the son of man came eating and drinking. And that's not what people expected of the Messiah. Not only that, but he urged his disciples to eat. I'm from a Middle Eastern background, and food is a love language in the Middle East. In fact, if you go to the Middle East, you might even get force-fed. Because if you don't eat, then we can't be friends. That's kind of how it works over there. And I, I love this passage in Scripture in John 12, too, or sorry, in Luke 7, where am I here? In, in John 21, 12, I just wanna make sure I get that right, where Jesus is cooking breakfast for his disciples. And he says, come, eat breakfast. And I just imagine my mom's Middle Eastern accent, come, eat breakfast, come eat. Because that's what they do in the Middle East. And I just love seeing Jesus in that way where he cares about nourishing the disciples. He wants to care for his friends. I think sometimes we neglect the daily discipline of eating and drinking, staying hydrated, right? And here's the interesting thing about it, especially in Lancaster County, I hear this weird phrase that I don't hear in many other places where people say, I just forgot to eat. I'm like, how can you forget to eat? I mean, what kind of work ethic do we have here that we forget to eat? And then your blood sugar drops and you get hangry and you feel awful and you're irritable and you think it's a spiritual attack, right? (laughs) But really, you just need to go get something to eat and grab a glass of water, right? My friend Levi Lusco, he's a pastor out in Montana, we were having a discussion about how sometimes we over-spiritualize things and he said, it might not be a a demon, it might just be dehydration. (laughs) Soul care means taking the time to fuel, fuel your body with healthy foods and making sure that you're taking care of the temple that God has given you. The next thing Jesus did was he rested. He took the time to rest. 
The God of the universe modeled to us what it looks like to stop and rest and sleep and recharge. And of course, he modeled it to us on the seventh day, but he also modeled it to us in his life here on earth. I love the passage after Jesus had finished a long day of ministry. He was exhausted. There was a lot of people. He was pouring out. And him and his disciples got into a boat to go to the other side. And it says that Jesus climbed down to the stern, Mark 4, 38. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Don't you just love the thought of imagining Jesus snoozing, taking a little rest? The God of the earth has a million things he could be doing with his time here on earth. And what does he decide to do? He takes a nap. Why? Because he knows the limitations of the human body. His God has no limitations. The Son of God is limitless, but he knows the limitations of the human body. I saw a shirt on Amazon the other day that I just have to share with you today because I think I need to buy myself one of these. (laughs) Jesus took naps. Be like Jesus. Sometimes it's the holiest thing you can do is realize I got limits. I need to rest. Are you taking time to rest in your own life? Do you get seven to nine hours of sleep? Do you practice the Sabbath, a day of rest? Or are your Sundays the rat race of the American dream? Going to church, going out to brunch, meeting family, going to soccer practice, then football practice, then running here and there, and at the end of Sunday, I feel exhausted. What does your life look like? Are you caring for yourself by taking time to pace yourself and rest? Number three. Connect. Jesus made time for life-giving relationships. He surrounded himself with disciples that he poured into and allowed them to pour into him. He had a solid community of friends. John 13, 23 refers to a scene in which Jesus was sitting around the table with his friends reclining. In ancient Jewish times, after they would eat a meal, they would recline and relax and hang out. And it says that Jesus was with the disciple whom he loved. He was referring to John. He loved him. They had a bond. They they were tight. They had a good relationship. Jesus had his people. Do you have your people? I think that life-giving relationships have become an extra bonus instead of essentials. And especially over the last few years, COVID has been a great excuse for us to stay away from life-giving relationships. But we were made to connect by a God who made us for relationships. What does it look like for you to invest in people and be intentional? Some of the loneliest people I know are actually people who are very low in intentionality. They're not picking up the phone, calling people, texting, inviting friends, starting that small group. They just kind of sit back and hope that friends come along. That's not how life works. If you are not intentional about surrounding yourself with life-giving community, it will not happen. And you will be alone. So what are the ways that you are taking steps to be intentional? with your community, to invest in others so that they can also invest in you. On the other hand, what are you doing to purge the toxic relationships from your life? You all know there's someone in your life who is draining with a capital D. Unhealthy, toxic. How can you set boundaries with the people that drain you so that you can engage in life giving relationships the way that God has called us to. Number four, and this is the most important one, in my opinion, protect. Jesus set important boundaries and protected his relationship with the Father. You know, a significant part of caring for yourself is having healthy boundaries and learning when to say no. I don't have time. I am unable. That is not going to work for me. Time and time again in scripture, we see Jesus pulling away from people, getting alone. In fact, the word in scripture is withdrew. He withdrew 
to lonely places to get time with the Father. He protected that time because he knew it was his lifeline. What does it look like for you? Luke 5, 16 says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places. In order to say yes to the Father, he had to say no to the demands and expectations and obligations of others. We've got to make time for the only one that can truly fill us up. How do you protect your relationship with God? How do you make space in your life to be filled by his presence and power? I also hear from people who are feeling confused. God feels distant. They don't know his will for their life. How much time are you actually spending in his presence? Because there's so much noise and distraction in this world. I mean, we're barely alone for five minutes. Sometimes I'll do a practice in my counseling office and have people sit for five minutes. No noise, no talking, no distractions. And it feels like an eternity when you haven't spent time alone with God. What does it look like in your life to protect your time with the Father? Are you making time to fill up or are you living on empty, just trying to get through the day with your own strength? Number five, Jesus enjoyed. He took the time to celebrate and enjoy the life that he'd been given. The Jewish culture of Jesus' time was full of opportunities to celebrate and gather and feast and savor life. Luke 22, seven through eight, Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Let's do this. Let's engage in these celebrations. He modeled to us how to slow down, how to enjoy life, how to enjoy the people around us and the purpose that God has given us. He went to wedding celebrations. He accepted invitations to people's homes when they said, hey, Jesus, come over. He wasn't like, oh, I'm so sorry, the kids have soccer and then we have to run to basketball and we won't have time. He was like, sure, let me come over. He made time to enjoy life and the people in his life, even while moving toward the ultimate goal of death on the cross for you and for me. I think sometimes we get so caught up in the work of life that we forget to enjoy the life that we've been given along the way. But part of caring for ourselves means being present and savoring the life that God has given us. As we're closing today, let me remind you that in order to live fully, you need to live filled because you can't pour out of empty places. So I wanna speak to two specific groups here today. The first group are those of you who are feeling really, utterly empty. Before you can practice any of these things that we talked about today, you've gotta get to the root of your why. What are the beliefs, the wounds, the roles that you've played for far too long that are holding you back from being filled? Maybe you need the help of a professional counselor to help you deal with some of those things from the past. If so, come find me. I'm gonna be at the resource table with books that can help you with referrals and connections and ways to help you become the healthiest that you can be because it has to start there. The next group of you isn't feeling totally empty right now, but you've been in empty seasons and you know with life, they come and go. How can you prepare for those empty seasons? By filling up today. What is one thing that we've learned today from the life of Jesus that the Holy Spirit is saying to you, you need to do a better job of this one. You need to work on this in your life so that you can be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. We're gonna take a moment to pray and during our prayer today, I want you to ask God to reveal to you an area of your life where you might be feeling empty. Ask him to help you get to the roots of the why and shine a light on how he wants you to care for yourself so that you can begin caring and pouring out for others. Let's take a moment to pray. Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for everyone in this room. 
I know that there are some people here today, Lord, that are feeling utterly empty. God, we can run to so many different things here in this world, but nothing and no one can fill us up in the way that you can fill us up. And I just pray that you would meet us today. Fill in those places. Help us to get to the root of some of our wounds and bring them to the surface, to your light, to be healed. God, you offer us fullness. And we just come before you today, humbly asking that you would fill us up from the inside out. In Jesus' name.